Hi folks, welcome to the very first episode of Physicist Explains. Today we're looking at Iron Man 1, the very start of the MCU, starring Robert Downey Jr. and Jeff Bridges, directed by Jon Favreau. Uh, we're going to be looking at the science and technology that are shown in this movie. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so you see that distinctive shatter pattern on the windshield that is caused by ballistics glass. Then it would stop uh, with, it's probably a 7.62 by 3.9 round. Uh, shouldn't be an issue for vehicle level uh, uh, ballistic glass. So let's go ahead and keep going. Okay, so looking at this, you see the explosion past the soldier out the window, and you see the holes come through. If anything, they're coming through slightly uh, in a forward pattern. Uh, he should be dead. <laughs> there is no question about it. He should be dead. Uh, you can see here the shrapnel. Uh, first of all, shrapnel doesn't cause nice, perfect, little tiny holes. I guess maybe if they were using ball bearings. But either way, if you're punching through the side of something, it doesn't like go through and then magically disintegrates. It's going to go and just keep on going. Uh, so the ballistic pattern of these, whether you're talking about going forward or backwards or whichever direction, is going to sit there and would just Swiss cheese Tony Stark in this situation. He's dead. That phone he's using is an LG 4900VX. Uh, I actually did look that up before this uh, sat there. and uh, I actually did go and look that up. So that phone he's using right there is a LG 4900VX. I actually did go and look that up. Um, that is kind of, you can think of it as a predecessor to the current LG Wing. So. Nice watch he's wearing. The irony of a Stark Industries bomb. Okay, so for the second time in 3 minutes and 29 seconds, Tony Stark is dead. <laughs> uh, so right here, what you're going to see is you're going to start seeing the blood seeping through and everything else like that. I remember this, this is a very distinctive thing. He's going to... Alright, so he opens his shirt up and so he sh he's wearing some kind of high-level ballistic armor. The only thing is, is that, uh, just like this shows... Shrapnel wouldn't be stopped by that. But even if he did somehow survive the shrapnel, only getting hit in the chest, even though the thing exploded in a radial pattern and didn't hit him in the face or head or anything else, even if he did somehow survive that, the fact is, with the way he was blown, the concussive wave would have turned his insides to jelly. He's dead as a doornail. At age four, he built his first circuit board. I like the fact they have, they show him, uh, obviously these are all Photoshop pictures of Robert Downey Jr. when he was young. I like the fact they put him here next to Bill Gates. That's funny. Okay, so you see here, uh, basically, it looks like he has his own very customized AI assistant, like you have Alexa or uh, Google Home or Siri or whatever. Uh, as you can see, you've got this high tech, all this information. It's got a keyboard and everything else showing that it's probably touch sensitive. This, even in 2008, uh, for someone this rich, is not outside the realm of possibility. You had... Um, HUD displays like this as early as the early 2000s in uh, high-end luxury cars and such like that. Uh, so just making it touch sensitive and everything else like that isn't super outside the realm of possibility. So I'm guessing from the way that this looks, this is some kind of uh, basically... Looks like you can access some kind of different systems. Maybe it's even just a thermostat. It's hard to tell from this. You can't really see. Um, 
It looks like he probably had some kind of fingerprint sensor built in. That's actually pretty far-fetched. Nowadays, you, you see the little fingerprint sensors on your power button and everything else like that. But back at this time, fingerprint sensors were still pretty wonky. And the chances of you being able to just grab it and it sit there and tell you, oh, you're authorized or not authorized, eh. it, would, it would probably almost always tell you you're unauthorized, tell you the truth. It'd be hard to get until you are authorized and actually recognize your fingerprints. Assuming that's how this works out, but I'm, I would assume so. You exploded here. Okay, so uh, this would be very, very advanced. It depends on what's happening here exactly. It's hard to tell from the screen and everything. Um, doing an exploded view of an engine, okay, if you have something that is custom made that you can load in a diagram and then tell it and then give it the verbal command explode, yes, it could deconstruct it virtually like this. That wouldn't be a problem. The hard part is the is what he says about the compression. This has given the impression that he had that the computer gets this knowledge from examining the uh, engine while it's still together, which you know that's pretty hard if now if he had a uh, gauge hooked up to it to go and sit there and measure the compression ratio and everything like that then you could sit there and say okay this is perfectly feasible it's hard to tell exactly what he's doing here but if he's just doing it by uh the computer you know having the engine there and the computer being a supercomputer yeah that's that's not possible even today maybe some time off in the far distant future but Okay, so that is, for those of you wondering what the sports car is, an Audi R8. It is uh, considered a supercar. It's considered an entry-level supercar. Uh, last time I checked, the price on a regular baseline R baseline R8 was about a hundred. It depends. Price fluctuates one hundred twenty to two hundred thousand dollars, depending on options and everything like that. Which for a supercar is not that expensive. Uh, looks like uh, happy here. Uh, played by director John Favreau is, I believe, a Bentley of some kind. You would expect a um, B Tony Stark to go and be driving a nicer supercar than that. You know, I, truthfully, with the way he plays and everything else in this movie, I would totally expect him to be pulling out a, a Veyron or something like that. But Bugatti didn't pay for product sponsorship, and Audi did. Okay, so obviously all the tech that you're seeing on this plane, the, you know, I'm guessing back in this day, this is probably an LCD screen and everything else is all perfectly feasible and everything. This is all perfectly feasible. The only thing I have a question about is the length of that dancing pole, we're going to call it. Uh, it's, but I guess if you had it specially installed, had the plane kind of built around it, it wouldn't be an issue. So, and he has enough money on this movie. He could easily have that done. Uh, it just, if you, if you go, hold on, I, hold on, let's replay this again real quick. So, when you look at the window height right here, where it's at. The floor is about roughly where that bottom of that stripe is, I'm guessing. Maybe a little bit lower than that. Is that long enough to store a pole long enough to go the entire interior of the fuselage? That's, hmm... That's truthfully that's the only that's, that's the most unrealistic part of this. That's always bothered me. Where does he put that pole at? I know it retracts, but it's not like a telescoping pole. It's just a retractable pole. Your consideration, the Jericho. Okay, so that was very interesting. Um, believe it or not, 
except for the repulsor technology they used to go and to drive the uh, missiles, everything about that was perfectly reasonable. The design of the missiles, where you break up into the multiple smart bombs that drop, is based on technology actually from the 60s. Uh, based on ballistic missile technology we developed to go, and the U.S. developed, I should say, to defeat Russian anti-ballistic missile countermeasures. Basically, MIRVs. Multiple, independently aimed re-entry vehicles. You would have a ballistic missile go up into space, it would open up, let multiple smart missiles out, and then they would fall and aim themselves at specific targets, overwhelming any potential uh, countermeasures. The Russians later developed the same tech, blah, 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 blah. So that tech is perfectly reasonable. The small explosion followed by the large explosion. That actually is also somewhat reasonable depending on the payload of the first explosion. Those could easily be what are known as fuel air bombs. Basically what you have is you have a explosive go out and it disperses an accelerant into the air and then a smaller second incendiary explosion go off and light that fuel up and it creates an incredibly huge explosion and just wipes out anything in the area. So all of that tech, except for the propulsion mechanism used, is perfectly feasible. Okay, so I did some Googling around, and that is a bottle of Laphroaig Old Malt Cask. It was bottled in 1980, it was distilled in 1987, aged for 17 years, bottled in 2005. And that's, and that's correct, because it would have been late in 87 that it was distilled and then bottled early. Uh, so, 17-year-old uh, Laphroaig Scotch, going price on it, it's only about $250 a bottle, which, for Scotch... It actually isn't that bad, although it does show that Tony is an Isla guy and does enjoy his smoky scotch. And uh, that's obviously just a really neato portable bar. I would very much like to have one. <laughs> okay, so this phone is an LG 4900VX. It was released about this time. You can think of it kind of the predecessor to the LG Wing. Uh, it like the wing was not very successful because it's kind of weird so anyways he's a verizon customer Wait, what are you doing? <laughs> okay so that is an induction electromagnet basically you sit there and put a dc current wound around a piece of ferrous material and it will magnetize that material this is reasonable in the construction not sure about the use we call them the walking dead because it takes about a week for the boss to use the vital organ for this use okay so the moving around of shrapnel in the body Obviously, the shrapnel is no longer under force from the explosion, so you would think it would just stay still. But the body's natural healing mechanism forces, expels foreign materials, and it does it in the shortest route possible. It's Your body's not smart enough to know, hey, if I go this way, I stab it into your heart. If I go the other way, then you're fine. So it just pushes it out as fast and as quick as possible. Uh, the weak timeline... I don't know about that. Seems a little bit on the uh, quick side. Maybe I'm wrong. I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not any kind of doctor. So I can't sit there and speak to that. But uh, as for using the electromagnet to hold it back, eh, I, 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 I kind of doubt it. Because what that means is that it is perfectly in pull with the body's natural ex expulsion mechanism. And that seems unlikely. Uh, you would either go and make it too weak and it would kill him or make it too strong and it would pull it out. Although I guess that might help. I don't know. Maybe he's worried about tearing up some kind of vital thing is coming out. I don't know. Uh, you'd have to ask Dr. Mike about that. So, uh, you know, so other, either way, uh, the idea of your body pushing something lethal into you isn't completely outside the realm of possibility. The electromagnet being used to keep it from doing that while at the same time not being able to extract it, that's more far-fetched. 
Now, a lot of people go and they're like, oh, these guys are so dumb and da 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 and uh, talk about how, you know, Tony Stark, how could you be fooled by what he's doing and think he's building you a missile? Well, the thing is, is that you have to remember that the idea behind the Jericho is that it was repulsor powered. It wasn't just a regular rocket. So you would expect him to go and to build something that you're not used to seeing. Now, as for ignoring the helmet and the arms and legs and all that, okay, maybe one of the guys was, you know, falling down on the job. But for him doing the complex electronic stuff and them saying, you know, that's not a rocket, that's unlikely because they know that the Jericho is something that they're not familiar with. So... Okay, so this process is known as sand casting. Uh, basically, you take diatomaceous earth, you put it into the shape that you want using some sort of mold. You then pour molten metal of whatever you want into that mold so that it will go and take the form and cool down. Uh, usually, you would have a, uh, a second negative to go and sandwich on top. I'm guessing that he must have taken that negative and taken it away or else he didn't need... Uh, a 3D, he only needed it three dimensional in one direction. The other side wasn't really relevant. Um, this is, you can actually do this uh, with aluminum, it's much more common for people who go and practice this as a hobby, but it is extremely, extremely dangerous. Do not do it without uh, professional supervision. Okay, so they're working on power sequencing, which means basically he's working on putting a clutch on this thing so it doesn't sit there and uh, use up all of the fuel that it runs on in the aforementioned 15 minutes. So basically, it's going to sit there and reroute the stuff through and everything else like that. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's pretty unlikely, just because you would need a couple of programmable chips and everything else. I mean, I guess maybe since he's using scrap from his advanced missiles he might have something in there that he could repurpose for this but it seems far-fetched to say the least okay so that's highly unlikely for him to have been able to bust down the door like that with multiple strikes because if you look his hands don't have any metal on them or anything else like that. It's just a leather glove. So even if he does have hydraulically actuated arms that can dent steel, that also means it's going to shatter his hand. So, yeah, that's unrealistic. I, I can't see the right arm. I know he's got a flamethrower on there, though. And it wouldn't be smart to go and potentially bend your nozzle that you're going to go and be putting fuel out of and trying to ignite. That would just That's a recipe for setting yourself on fire. Okay, so the problem with the giant eye holes on this mask, as you can see, he takes several shots to the face. Those rounds are going to splatter, and most likely he would be blind. Maybe not dead, unless a bullet went through the eye hole. Now, a bullet can always go through the eye hole. That's why they don't put eye holes. That's why you wouldn't put eye holes in that. That's why his Iron Man suit doesn't have an eye hole in it. But this one does. So if a bullet goes through the eye hole, he's dead. If not, he's just blind. <laughs> Also, once again, leather gloves for the hands. So if he gets shot in the hand, he's that hand's gone. Okay, so these are supposedly military-grade weapons. I'm going to tell you right now. You hit something with the thinness of metal that he's wearing, because I don't care how much that thing weighs, if it gets hit by a 50 BMG round, it is going through it. He is dead. Repeatedly, explicitly, no questions, dead. Okay, he's dead. 
He is dead. No question about it. Because uh, apparently the people are so amazed that he managed to build an Iron Man suit and an arc reactor out in the middle of the desert. I'm more amazed that apparently he has discovered an inertial... He has d developed the first inertial dampener. Because there is no other reason that he should not be paced in the desert right now. That height, that speed, crashing down with a hard metal suit on, he's dead as a doornail. How did they find him? <laughs> there is, sorry, there is no way they're finding him. I don't care how much he's trying to be seen. He's in the middle of the desert. They don't know where he was taken to initially. He's just gone. And they just happen to have, they just happen to run across him. And not only do they happen to run across him, it happens to be Rhodey that, that's riding with them. No, that is totally unrealistic. I'll tell you right now. Segway, the transportation of the future. <laughs> uh, okay, the arc reactor, at the time that this movie was made, it was just a MacGuffin. It was a thing in the movie they developed so that you could have this amazing, compact, super energetic thing to generate power that you need to go and power an Iron Man suit. However, 2014, MIT students who guess who Tony Stark happens to be an alumnus of in this movie, went and developed a design for an advanced tokamak for a uh, affordable, robust, compact fusion reactor that would go and based on the tokamak and basically called it an arc reactor. Hey. As we've discussed, extremely, extremely expensive, but plausible in 2008. Extremely expensive, even though it's plausible in 2021. It's him. Okay. Yeah, it should be fun if it's up. By the way, this is great special effects. I, I'm loving the special effects. But they they basically have a fake body with the recess into it. And Tony Stark, or Robert Downey Jr. rather, is sitting in the chair. is concealing the rest of his body. And it's, it's basically a magic trick. And I love it. It's just... This is a practical effect, which makes it even better. Okay. I'm pretty sure it's a practical effect. If this is CGI, it's even better than that. But, uh, man. Operation Jarvis, you up? Well, he's, uh, old now, that would be a perfectly reasonable keyboard. Once again, in this time frame, we're looking at extremely, stupidly, super expensive. Also, response time would be absolute trash you'd press up i mean even then you could see he would press it and it would take a second to respond so there you go i'd like to open a new phone i just don't know who to trust right now that is not happening not happening then not happening now not in that kind of detail especially with what he does to it and everything else we have several ways of creating this illusion but yeah totally unrealistic this doesn't exist. Didn't exist then. Doesn't exist now. You're no benefit at all. All right. Once again, completely unrealistic. No, up there. You can't give a robot those kind of robo commands and it sit there and operate with the precision that we see happening here. It's just not possible. He's dead. <laughs> He's dead again. Uh... Okay, maybe, possibly, not dead, extremely injured in the hospital for a while, but definitely not okay. Okay, so what was unrealistic about that? Well, the fact is, is that even assuming that these repulsors don't go and have a huge amount of heat generated from them that would go and scorch the linoleum floor, you have the problem of dust and everything else. The fact is, is that no matter how shiny and everything is, there's always something on the ground. 
nothing moved. You see a little bit of maybe smoke that was generated by these, is probably water condensation because, uh, but even that would require a temperature change. So either way though, you have the issue that there was no movement of anything else. This small object over here in the uh, corner right here, you see me circling it with my mouse right now, that probably would have gotten blown over for something that was powerful enough to lift a human being off the ground, so. All right, that was a much more realistic flight. You saw there was actual interaction with the environment, all those papers flying up. Although, once again, if it was powerful enough to lift a human and, then, uh, and it was that small of a concentrated amount of thrust in that small of an area, those pa papers would be flying around much more violently than that. Okay. I have indeed been uploaded, sir. We're online and ready. We start the virtual walk around. Okay, so even a Google Glass, even Google Glasses today are not this good of a heads-up display. Uh, so back in 2008, highly unlikely that this something this advanced would be possible. Nowadays, we're working towards something like this, but it's still not there. All right, so this is a realistic depiction of a real problem, uh, namely icing on flight controls when you're going into high altitudes. Basically, it's really cold up there, and ice can build up even though it's not a whole bunch of moisture. There's enough there that it builds up over time and will freeze out your uh, control surfaces, and you will have an issue. And it's still an issue with commercial flights today, but that's why they have special de-icers to go and to uh, treat the wings so that this does not happen. Next to Cisco, have it reconfigure the shell metals use the gold titanium alloy from the Seraphim Taxil satellite that should ensure fuselage integrity while maintaining ground to weight ratio. Got it? Yes. Okay, so he says use a gold titanium alloy. Uh, gold titanium is a specialized alloy, obviously. Guess what? Gold and titanium. But the thing is, is that it's extremely lightweight, extremely durable, up to four times stronger than titanium by itself. Uh, so it is used a lot in uh, extremely... Uh, in areas where there's extreme wear expected, such as in, uh, such as dentistry and such like that. So. Okay, so you actually, if assuming that this is built on the same idea as a Vortex air cannon, uh, and it's just using something much more powerful coming out much faster you actually could go and have a relatively solid blast like that go up to a considerable distance it'd be actually be quite shocked how far that would go so uh except for the fact that you know you'd have something that small in the palm of your hand and the fact that you know you have this super awesome force technology at your hand except for those things <laughs> That's actually somewhat realistic. It just depends on the way that you go and expel it and have it rooted through the system here. Uh, so is it plausible to have something that small in the palm of your hand? No. Is it plausible for you to go and take something that isn't a solid object and propel it in a uh, concentrated fashion over a long distance? Yes. Definition of long distance varies. Okay, the suiting up sequence. Would this be possible? And the answer is sort of. <laughs> so you can actually program machines to do extremely precision things like that in a very rote way. The only catch is, is that Tony would have to move himself in such a way that when it does these things, it puts the suit on him. So it's as much up to him as it is up to the robots. Basically, if he hit the button and didn't step into the suit, they should still try to construct a suit and just leave an Iron Man shell minus Tony 
in the same platform. Tony just happens to maneuver himself into the suit as it's built around him. As has been pointed out repeatedly, uh, his knee would be shattered from that, assuming that his spine wasn't completely compressed and broken from the extreme change in acceleration and landing. All right, would that be possible? Technically, yes. The logistics of it would be an absolute nightmare, though, to sit there and just... I mean, it, technically, technically, it would be possible, but man, I wouldn't... That system alone would take months and months, if not years, to build. And he has supposedly put this entire suit together in three months. And he's dead. <laughs> he, he's dead from the initial shot because the concussive force of that, the way it pushed him off, would have killed him. And even if by some miracle that didn't kill him, the extreme fall would have. Or technically, the stop at the bottom of the extreme fall. There is no way he survived that. None. He's not dodging that tank bullet like that, by the way. If you, if you ever seen a tank fire, it's like, boom! It's just immediate. There is no dodging the bullet as it goes past you. No, that's not happening. Now, he could go and, well... It still wouldn't happen like that. It just wouldn't happen. The closest you could come is to use a shape charge and to hit the fuel tank. All you do then, though, is blast a hole into it and set the whole tank on fire, but you don't get that massive Hollywood explosion. Okay, so you see Tony just barely staying ahead of the F-22s. He starts outpacing them a bit. So an F-22's max speed is about Mach 1.8. Because of the speed we see him moving away from them, he's probably not traveling a whole bunch faster than that. He's traveling like, you know, maybe 1.9, maybe even 2. Okay, although that would be pretty fast. You're talking uh, 0.2, you're talking 140 miles an hour faster than they are. Um, the thing is, is that... A Sidewinder missile, which is what they fired at him, would be running at about Mach 2.5. So, you're talking 300 miles an hour. You're not going to have this thing where he's flying along and the missile slowly gains on him until he can go and let off his flares. It would be, soup. it would hit him at 700 miles an hour, you know. So, yeah, that's, or uh, uh, 350 miles an hour, rather. So, that's highly unrealistic that he would sit there and have time to deploy flares. The only way that could possibly maybe work is if it, they was still in the acceleration phase. But the acceleration phase on a Sidewinder missile is very short. Very, very short. And uh, he's he's almost certainly dead. Yeah. Oh, and I forgot to mention the concussive force from the missile exploding would have turned him to jelly again. So, there you go. Gotta love the old flip phones. Come on. Super, they were super durable, though. They actually still used, uh, if you get a mil-spec phone, it's generally still a flip phone. Because they're so tough. I'm hit. I'm hit. Okay, so, he's dead. <laughs> he basically got hit in the back with an airplane going at who knows how fast. He's dead. Dead, 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 dead. By the way, those were F-22s that was chasing him. So uh, he just sat there and cost the U.S. government in the neighborhood of $140 million. So there you go. You've been re-engaged. Execute a basic maneuver. Keep going. Oh, 
believe it or not, of that whole sequence, the most unrealistic thing was that Jarvis was able to tell him that he had been re-engaged. The only way he would know that is if he was intercepting the communications from the airplane with its base. Because there's no way he saw that on the radar, I'm guessing. Because on a large radar, much less one that would fit onto a suit, the F-22 has the cross-section of, I think, of, I believe a sparrow. It's incredibly small and unlikely that a radar that would fit onto a system on a suit would be powerful enough to go and pick it up. I designed this to come off, so... Ow! Hey! So, once again, kind of what I was talking about in reverse. If he doesn't get in the exact right position, those robots are not going to be able to deconstruct that suit properly. So, obviously, extremely unrealistic to sit there and hit someone with an auditory signal and it paralyzes them, much less the blue veins creeping across the face as that happens. So, yeah, totally unrealistic. That's, that's not happening. A ghost drive. Ooh, that just means that they sat there and put it as a hidden drive. That's... They made it sound all techy and everything, but in actuality, if you just you can go into your computer and just right click and just put, you know, basically uh, you can put it so that uh, you can hide files so that you have to turn on an option to see the thing. But it's not it's it's nothing like super techy. It just made it sound cool. Hold on. So we see him grab the suit, and the next day, he has a complete updated new uh, <laughs> beta, basically, of the design. Yeah, that's not happening. Okay, that's full of junk right there. <laughs> Translate. Okay. And then the fact... The thing that really makes it so unrealistic isn't even that. Because I could see someone writing a program where you write that in and it works. The The biggest problem is, is that when it translates, it translates it into the actual speaker's voice. There's also the fact that a lot of languages don't use the same uh, sentence construction that English does. So you'd have to say translate, it would have to go through, read all the audio, translate it over into its exact English meanings, and then reconstruct it into a sentence that makes sense in English without sounding stilted, because this did not sound at all stilted. So yes, completely unrealistic. So he had a tool the exact same size, the exact same mechanism to take out the arc reactor from Tony's chest. That. Okay. Okay, so all of this is extremely unrealistic. The whole idea is that the arc reactor powers an electromagnet, which keeps the uh, shrapnel from reaching Tony's heart. And the doc said that when he installed the electromagnet, he had a week without the electromagnet. So how come Obadiah takes it out and in five minutes, in 15 minutes, he's crawling around the floor half dead. Breaks its own internal logic. Maybe there's a much bigger time jump here, but this looks like he built this in about 48 hours. So where was the arc reactor in that shot? It's not, I mean, does he have like a, 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 a shutter to cover it up? <laughs> Plus there's the fact that Tony, every time he wants to get in a suit, it has to be constructed around him. Apparently Obadiah's, you just climb in? And they're both dead. <laughs> Tony Stark became a 
squishy red mass upon impact with Obadiah Stane, and Obadiah just had every bone in his body broken. Howard reduced to 19%. Dead families probably survived, but they'd be a lot more hurt than that. They basically sat there and had a 20 mile per hour wreck. And he's dead again. I mean, you just can't take that kind of a shot in a human body and survive. Your body stays still, the suit accelerates however fast it accelerates, you hit the inside of the suit, and then you go both flying off and you hit something else, the suit stops and you keep going. It's just, no. I guess he could survive it, but he'd be extreme internal injuries. Stand in my way. And he's dead again. Concussive force turns him to jelly. Jesus, this thing is back. Get me made around. Scramble the jets. Wait a minute. So these guys are both in Afghanistan and in the US. That's not how this works. He actually would have survived that. Pepper should be sliced to ribbons right now. I mean, it probably wouldn't be fatal, but she would have small cuts all over her. Oh, apparently Obadiah, you just jump in, so... So Tony Stark's dead again. Yeah, Tony's dead and he's fried. Um, <laughs> now, uh, it depends on what... I'm not sure what the arc reactor is in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I don't think it is a fusion reactor like the one that was developed by the MIT students we talked about earlier. Uh, if it was, um, it's possible to have this type of explosion without going and having a th thermonuclear blast. Uh, but, uh, yeah... Either way, I would I would expect this to be a little more devastating with how what the energy output of this machine is. Although apparently they just discharged the machine. Now, if you overload it, see once again, if you overloaded a thermonuclear reactor, then you would have a meltdown, and then you could have some major issues. Uh, it just depends on what it is. All right, so that was Iron Man 1. What'd you think? Leave me comments below. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe. Check out our other videos such as ERB Explained, and I will see you guys next time.